Some persons can proceed untroubled by proceeding blindly, believing they have traveled the main highway and that all intersections have been with byways. But to proceed with awareness and imagination is to be affected by the memory of crossroads which one will never encounter again. Some persons sit at the crossroad taking neither path because they cannot take both, cherishing the illusion that if they sit there long enough, the two ways will resolve themselves into one and both be possible. A large part of maturity and courage is the ability to make such renunciations and a large part of wisdom is the ability to find ways which will enable one to renounce as little as possible. With this quote by Alan Wheelis, welcome to an introduction to the book Existential Psychotherapy by the American professor of psychiatry, Irvin Yalom. Irvin Yalom is born in 1931 and the author of several fictional and non-fictional bestsellers. His novel, When Nietzsche Wept, has been published in over one million copies in Germany alone. And among his non-fictional works, he is very well known for the book Existential Psychotherapy from 1980. Irvin Yalom defines existential psychotherapy as a dynamic approach to therapy which focuses on concerns that are rooted in the individual's existence. Irvin Yalom identifies four ultimate concerns. Death freedom, existential isolation, and meaninglessness. The idea of death is the most obvious, the most easily apprehended ultimate concern. We exist now, but one day we shall cease to be. Death will come and there is no escape from it. It is a terrible truth and we respond to it with mortal terror. But death is also the non pareil the condition that makes it possible for us to live life in an authentic passion. For the idea of death is not an enemy. Rather, the idea of death can enhance our sense of living in the present moment, trivialize the trivial and be a powerful ally in the pursuit of integration and maturity. In the words of Martin Heidegger, the idea of death can move us from a state of forgetfulness of being to a state of mindfulness of being. In this authentic state, one faces absolute freedom and nothingness and is anxious in the face of them. But death is a terror-provoking idea we ordinarily quickly try to deny via two different modes. We can believe in our own specialness and personal inviolability, or we can put our faith in the existence of an ultimate rescuer. When we instead confront death, Irvin Yalom suggests that although the physicality of death destroys man and fills us with terror, the awareness of personal death can catalyze a process of personal change and open the mind for a radical shift of life perspective, a renewed sense of proportionality, and a sense of liberation. But it is not easy to contemplate personal death. As the novelist John Fowles phrases it, Death is rather like a certain kind of lecturer. You don't really hear what is being said until you're in the front row. After this introduction to death, let's consider another ultimate concern, man's fundamental freedom. A patient caught up in a highly self-destructive relationship stated, I cannot decide what to do. I can't bring myself to end the relationship, but I pray that I could catch him in bed with another woman so that I would be able to leave him. From our first thought, we bear responsibility for our choices and have the freedom to create our own life, just as we have the freedom to desire, to choose, to act and to change. Viewed in its existential sense, freedom refers to the absence of eternal structure. Rather, the individual is entirely responsible for his or her own world, life design, choices and actions. In the words of Sartre, man is the being whose project is to be God. This is a deeply frightening insight. Consider its implication. Nothing in the world has significance except by virtue of one's own creation. In this perspective, our existence is merely a cosmic indifference. There are no rules, no ethical systems, no values, no external reference whatsoever. To experience existence in this manner is a dizzying sensation. 
the relationship between wishing and deciding is the link that defines us to the world. This bridge can be crossed in five ways. The reasonable decision where we consider the arguments for and against and have a feeling of choosing freely. The willful, strenuous and hard decisions where we experience that the burden of choice is forced upon us. These decisions are rare. Most decisions are made without effort. The drifting decision where there seems to be no paramount reason for either course of action and we let ourselves drift in a direction determined from without. The impulsive decision where we let inner turmoil and emotions decide. And a decision based on a change of perspective as a consequence of some important outer experience or inward change. But decisions are expensive and will cost you everything else. They also serve as a bitter invitation to reflect upon and regret one's past sins. If one accepts responsibility for one's life situation and makes the decision to change, the implication is that one alone is responsible for the past wreckage of one's life and could have changed long ago. This causes an intense existential guilt and ensuing depression human beings can try to handle by trying to avoid decisions in various ways. A common dynamic defense against responsibility awareness is the creation of a psychic world in which we do not experience freedom but exist under the sway of some irresistible ego alien not me force. We can avoid personal responsibility by displacing it to another or we can experience ourselves as innocent victims of events. We can deny responsibility by claiming loss of control or we can avoid autonomous behavior by repressing and insisting that everything is okay and well as it is. We can also soften or numb the awareness and pain of decision. The most obvious method of avoiding a decision is procrastination. We can also de-evaluate and downgrade the unchosen alternative, or we can emphasize and upgrade values of a chosen alternative unproportionately. We can delegate the decision to someone, or we can delegate the decision to something. But Whatever we do, we can never escape choosing. That's not to say other factors are not at play. Are you drowning in a deep swimming pool? Your options are limited. But even then you have the freedom to choose how you approach the situation. This is no minor kibble. Even though the image of a drowning man's possessing freedom may appear ludicrous, the idea behind is of great significance. One's attitudes towards one's situation is the very crux of being human. It cannot be denied that environment, genetics or chance plays a role in one's life. The limiting circumstances are obvious, but what distinguishes this man is his ability to transcend circumstances and fashion a meaningful life despite them. This experience of freedom and responsibility is a deeply terrifying state of mind that also reminds man of the discrepancy between what one is and what one could be. When the call of conscience is heard, we are always guilty to the extent that we have failed to fulfill authentic possibility. This generates a flood of self-contempt the individual must cope with throughout life. No one has depicted existential guilt more vividly and arrestingly than Franz Kafka. The process begins. Someone must have maligned Joseph K. for, without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one fine morning. On the surface, Joseph K. seems victim of a bureaucratic and authoritarian system, but regarded as a metaphor for man's existential conditions, Joseph K. is guilty. Guilty in his unlived and lonely life. The most telling episode takes play when Joseph K. asks the priest if he can obtain a mode of living completely outside the jurisdiction of the court. The priest replies with a tale of a man that begged admittance to the law. Upon arrival, the man is told that he may enter without permissions, but that there are more doors inside with doorkeepers at every door, one more powerful than the other. Faced with these challenges, the man decides to wait until he gets permission, but after having waited for many years and now dying of age, he poses one last question to the doorkeeper. 
How does it come about that in all these years no one has come seeking admittance but me? The doorkeeper bellows in the man's ear for his hearing too is fading. No one but you could gain admission through this door, since this door was intended for you. I am now going to shut it. The story is moving, but how does one know when one has lost one's way? How does one find it again? Martin Heidegger, Paul Tillich, Abraham Maslow and Rollo May would answer in unison, through guilt. They agree that existential guilt is a lighthouse showing man back to his authentic self, and that the best way, perhaps the only way of dealing with guilt is through atonement. One cannot will backward. One can atone for the past only by altering the future. Having considered man's ultimate freedom, let's look at man's existential isolation. Existential isolation is a fundamental isolation which cuts beneath all other isolation, a cleavage between man and world. No matter how close each of us becomes to another, there remains a final, unbridgeable gap. Each of us enters existence alone and must depart from it alone. Only we can feel our feelings, dream our dreams, make our decisions and die our death. Perhaps animals have some sense of shepherd and shelter, but humankind, cursed by self-awareness, must remain exposed to existence. We can react to existential isolation in three distinct ways. We can be in a state of forgetfulness of being where we choose to believe we only exist to the extent we exist in the eyes of others. We can also be in a state of fusion where we in reality proclaim I am not alone, I am part of others. Or we can be in a state of mindfulness of being. In this state one marvels not about the way things are but that they are. To exist in this mode means to be continually aware of being to exist authentically. In this state, one becomes fully self-aware, embraces one's possibilities and limits, and confronts existence, ultimate freedom and nothingness. The philosopher and theologian Martin Buber separated between two basic types of relationship, the I-Thou relationship and the I-It relationship. In the I-It relationship, one holds back something of oneself. One inspects the it from many possible perspectives, categorizes, analyzes and judges it and decides upon its position in the grand scheme of things. The I-Thou relationship is fundamentally different, not only because you is different from it, but because the very I is different in the two situations. In the I-Thou relationship, I becomes betweenness and thou is regarded as an equal thinking and feeling human being. In the I-It relationship, I as a mere observer and the other it is regarded like a tool or something to carry a function. Martin Buber stresses that though the I-Thou constitutes an ideal to which, which one should strive, it exists in only rare moments. One has to live primarily in the I-It world. To live solely in the Thou world would result in a burning up in the white flame of the Tao. Life also consists of practical matters and planning and we have to live mainly in the I-It world. But the more you experience the world as an I-It relation, the less you will experience you live up to life's full potential. Thus, one may take a portion of the isolation into oneself and bear it courageously or, to use Heidegger's terms, resolutely. As for the value of a good relationship, no one says it better than Martin Buber. A great relationship breaches the barriers of a lofty solitude, subdues its strict law and throws a bridge from self-being to self-being across the abyss of dread of the universe. With these words on existential isolation and authentic relationships, let's look at the question of meaninglessness. The question of meaning is the most perplexing and insoluble question of all. For what is the meaning of life? If there is no preordained design for us, then each of us must construct our own meanings of life. Yet can a meaning of one's own creation be sturdy enough to bear one's life? 
this existential dynamic conflict stems from the dilemma of human being as a meaning-seeking creature thrown into a universe that has no meaning. In this sense, the universe is absurd. Still, we struggle to find meaning in accordance with two types of meaning, cosmic meaning and secular meaning. Cosmic meaning implies some grand design existing outside of and superior to the person. Invariably, it refers to a magical or spiritual ordering of the universe, although cosmic meaning can also be expressed as faith in a higher cause or purpose or a charismatic leader or another authority. Another meaning type is secular meaning that can be sought via altruism or the belief that it is good to give to be useful to others to make the world better for others is a powerful source of meaning that needs no further justification. Dedication to a cause is another rich source of meaning that can lift the individual out of himself and make him a cooperating part of a vaster scheme where he can transcend himself. A third source of meaning is creativity in its broad sense and whether or not it takes place in the arts, scientific discovery, bureaucracy, teaching or anything else. A fourth source of meaning is the hedonistic solution where pleasure is considered a goal in itself or self-actualization or the belief that human beings should strive to actualize themselves and that they should dedicate themselves to realizing their inbuilt potential. Of course, these life activities are by no means mutually exclusive and gradually evolve throughout an individual's life cycle. The concerns of a 20-year-old is not the same as a 40 or 50 years old. But that we have thoughts about meaning does not necessarily imply that our actions also reflect these thoughts. When uncertainty takes over, we can choose between different reactions. We can do as others or submit to a totalitarian ruler where we behave as we believe others wish us to behave. We can choose a never-ending crusadism where we seek and dedicate ourselves to one dramatic and important cause after another, or we can choose nihilism where we question everything others purport to have meaning. We can sink into various degrees of vegetation or maintain a pattern of frenetic activity that so consumes our energy that the issue of meaning is drained of its toxin. But regardless of what behavioral pattern we choose, we will always look for meaning and experience dysphoria in the face of an indifferent, unpatterned world. Patterns explain and soothe. When one is unable to find a coherent pattern, one feels not only annoyed and dissatisfied, but also helpless. The belief that one has deciphered meaning always brings with it a sense of mastery. Even if the meaning schema that one has discovered involves the idea that one is puny, helpless or dispensable, it is nonetheless more comforting than a state of ignorance. Camus believes that man can attain full stature only by living with dignity in the face of absurdity and develop several clear values and guidelines for conduct. Courage, prideful rebellion, fraternal solidarity, love and secular saintliness. There is nothing equal to the spectacle of human pride. There is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn, as can be phrased it. With those words, we've come full circle. For Yalom and the existential tradition as a whole, it is central that man at some point must realize that no explanations, perspective or outer factors can shield him from death. We can become workaholics in the belief that we are getting ahead and working us up. We can lay down plans and project ourselves into the future and tell ourselves that we are about to become something. But the project is doomed. At some point, we all discover that we are no longer growing up, but growing old. Until then, life may have seemed an endless upward slope with nothing but the distant horizon in view, but all of a sudden one seems to have reached the crest of the hill from where stretching ahead is the downward slope with the end of the road in sight. Far enough away, it's true, but there is death observably present at the end, as one of Irvin Yalom's patients put it. No one that embarks on a true self-searching journey can avoid confronting death and 
It is one of the mature adults' main tasks in life to accept life's gradual decay and impairment. When the illusion of immortality burst, many people feel that had they only realized, truly realized this earlier, they would have led a different life. But if you are able to develop a healthy and reflected attitude towards death, your appetite for life and your chances of feeling that you have had a full life will grow. As Irvin Yalom phrases it, the physicality of death destroys man, but the awareness of personal death saves him. In one sense, the discovery of life's ultimate concerns is not difficult. The method is deep personal reflection and the conditions simple. Solitude, silence, time and freedom from everyday distractions. Irvin Yala mentions an exercise that can enhance the awareness of death and finality. On a blank sheet of paper, draw a straight line. One end of the line represents your birth and the other end your death. Draw a cross to represent where you are now. Meditate upon this for five minutes. This short and simple exercise almost invariably evokes powerful and profound reactions. And let's end this introduction to existential psychotherapy with some last thoughts from Irvin Yalom. The belief that life is incomplete without goal fulfillment is not so much a tragic existential fact of life as it is a Western myth, a cultural artifact. The Eastern world never assumes that there is a point to life or that it is a problem to be solved. Instead, life is a mystery to be lived. Life just happens to be and we just happen to be thrown into it. Life requires no reason. With those words, thank you for your attention. I present this introduction to Irvin Yalom and existential psychotherapy with much humility. Irvin Yalom's work is far too rich and complex to allow but a very brief and sketchy introduction and I urge the listener to pick up Irvin Yalom's own words. They are a gold mine of thoughts. Also, of course, you are very welcome to contact me or visit my website where you will find more videos and presentations on existentialism, organizational theory, and trust-based management. Again, thanks for your attention. <laughs>